Grüß, uh, willkommen in einem Mann in einem Fragens Video. Welcome to yet another exciting video. In this case, episode 2 of my game design series of videos. In this video, I'll be providing a brief overview of World War II and Cold War squad or section figure game rules. This represents the fifth update to this video, covering more rules and cleaning up the format. I've changed this video from discussing the history of game systems to a simple review of rules as most of the viewers seem more interested in that than understanding when different game systems were first used or are no longer used. In this case, this video will cover rules which I call squad or section scale, where each element or base represents a vehicle or a squad or section of infantry. This allows a player to command a couple of standard companies or alternatively a weak battalion. This scale was probably the most common in terms of commercial rules, and while other scales, or at least originally, and while other scales have grown since the uh, hobby really kicked off in the 70s or 60s, this scale is still reasonably popular for gamers. The key point is each figure represents a single vehicle, so for players who like tanks, this is the ideal scale. Skirmish scale is more for players who prefer infantry actions, so this is where most lovers of armoured vehicles start rather than skirmish rules. If you want to have a game which can, can be completed comfortably within a day, you need to limit the number of elements per side to 50 or less. If each element represents a vehicle or infantry squad slash section, then a player can be expected to field about two companies. A typical platoon would consist of three to five elements, and a typical company would have three platoons plus a heavy weapons platoon, totaling an average of about 20 elements per battalion, if we include supporting troops. So when we look at the numbers in that particular way, we can see that you, at this scale, a player could be expected to command a battalion. This brings up the topic of how do you describe rules scales? You can use the individual element, which means this is a squad or section scale set of rules, which is what I use for this video series, or use the typical formation of player commands, which in this case would be a battalion. I have no idea which is the better system, but I will stay with the element scale as some players have no issues fielding 200 elements for a three-day game, which means even at this scale you could field a brigade. While not really that significant, any rules which use this scale normally employs combat units which are platoon size. While most rules do not have any specific rules for what I call combat units, most players keep their elements into platoon sized units or combat units. In some rare cases, the rules employ platoon headquarters, which would require players to keep platoons together, but this is generally not very common. Finally, let's look at the headquarters. Almost all sets of rules possess two levels of command. A CNC, which represents the player, a number of subordinate sub-commanders, and then the combat units, or in some cases the individual elements themselves. At this scale, the CNC is a battalion headquarters and the sub-commanders are company headquarters. This lists many of the squad scale micro armor rules which were published in the last, let's say, 50 years. We can use this list to understand the rules trends which occurred between 1968 and 2010. The, real, the first real innovation was the move from a simultaneous sequence of play to a sequential sequence of play. From that point on, the steady trend was increased complexity and detail until in 2002, when Flames of Wars were published, um, this trend was reversed. Flames of War went back to a simple, quick play game system, which prov proved extremely popular. Today, most new rules tend to focus on simplicity and quick play, although the urge for complexity is strong at this scale. I must point out that while most of the images used in this video are from my games, I've added several O-Group games from the internet to add variety and bling. In terms of figure scale, 6mm tends to be the main scale used in this type of rules, or these type of rules for many years. In the beginning it was mainly using 172 scale figures and today more commonly 15mm or 100 scale. The scale does lend itself to 15mm figures if you keep the game size small. If you want a full battalion then 6mm is the scale that you need to focus on. Ungriff may have been the first set of modern micro armor rules ever published. It was first published in 1968 and later revised and expanded in 1972 and 
1982 by R. Zimmerman and D. Myers. Apart from being the first set of published rules, the sequence of play was the ma- or a major innovation, attempting to duplicate simultaneous movement into a sequential sequence of play. As with many early rules, there was a major focus on gun specification and armour thickness. These rules were designed for HO scale. Fast Rules is a set of rules developed by Mike Reese and Leon Tucker and published as a 24-page pamphlet in 1970 by the Armoured Operations Society, an affiliate of the IFW. Gudeon Games made a second printing in 1972. I have minimal information concerning these rules, but as it came out shortly after Ungriff, it's safe to say it used a similar scale. As for the game system, this is unknown by myself, but was possibly very similar to Tractics. Tractics was the successor to Fast Rules and developed by Mike Reese and Leon Tucker, with contributions by Gary Gygax. The first edition was designed for 20mm scale figures, but by the second printing it was catering for 6mm figures as well. These rules were first to cater for micro-armour figures, and the rules proved very popular. This set of rules used an umpire, which was a trend which was beginning about now, especially in the US. While in principle the idea of having an umpire was good, in practice it was not popular, as one player was forced to be the umpire instead of having fun playing. A new reprint print of these rules occurred in 2021, allowing new players to try these classic rules. In the UK, the first set of popular micro-armour figure gaming rules was WRG Armour and Infantry 1925-1950, published in 1973. These rules did away with umpires and simplified the sequence of play. While reasonably detailed, it was a simple set of rules which proved rather popular. Like many rules from this company, they were terse, which did make them difficult to learn, but the payoff was a small set of rules which could easily be referenced. These rules stimulated the creation of a great deal of supporting materials, such as army lists. As it provided a point system, these rules were also used for competitions, although scenario quality varied a great deal within the competition. These rules are available on the internet as a PDF download even today, and some people still do use it. Panzer Warfare was published before the second edition of Tractics by TSR. I lack any details about these rules. With the second edition of Tractics and lack of supporting material, it failed to develop, and no second edition or follow-up material eventuated. It's interesting to note that Brian Bloom, Gary Jugax and Dave Armstrong were all involved in the formation of TSR, which was publishing Dungeons & Dragons. It's safe to assume that these rules and tactics and fast rules were all part of a close-knit ecosystem. Cumbrae to Sinai, another set of UK rules, moved the detail and complexity bar to new levels. The sheer detail provided proved popular, although playing a game was slow and rarely was there a result. This was a trend which was repeated a great deal in the UK, and with some sets of rules in the US. While to experienced gamers this detail was attractive, in practice the rules never proved popular from a game-playing point of view. For a short period it was considered an alternative to WRG rules, but only for a short period. Combat Commander was the US answer to Cambrai to Sinai, and it moved the detail and complexity bar even further. From a modern warfare point of view, the detail was impressive, and I still vividly remember trying to use long rod penetrators without really understanding what they were. Experienced players flocked to these rules, but after trying to learn them many times and failing, I'm uncertain how many gamers or games were actually played. Good on the bookshelf, but not useful for an actual game. In 1979, a major rewrite of the WRG rules were published specifically for modern conflicts called Wargamers Rules for Armoured Warfare 1950-1985. This edition proved very popular due due to its focus on modern warfare. The other rules available for this period were too complex to be playable and these rules filled the gap beautifully. As with the earlier editions or edition, a large amount of supporting material was published for these rules and they were often used in competitions. I personally ran several. The sequence of play had become more complex, but apart from that, the only innovations was that there was a simple that they were a simple and playable set of rules which could allow players to refight modern conflicts in a reasonable period of time. In 1979, Kampfgruppen was published, although I lack a copy and have no information about these rules. Based on the quality, they looked like club rules and, I, and did not appear to gain much traction. 
1983, Challenger was published, which proved one of the most playable of the very complex game system rules. Pushing the detail and complexity envelope further than any other set of rules, it was just playable. Having used these rules many times, I was forced to simply ignore a host of weapon systems such as aircraft and helicopters in order to make it playable. A game took an entire day to complete, or, or about twice the time of WRG rules. Its sheer detail was very attractive, and a large amount of supporting material was published for it. Its complexity was a turn-off for new players, so the main audience was existing WRG players who seeked more detail and complexity, which I can assure you they achieved, or they got, when they played Challenger. Ian Shaw, along with Bruce Ree Taylor, provided a lot of supporting material for the WRG rules. Like Bruce, Ian decided to create his own set of rules. While more complex than WRG, they were simpler than Challenger and focused on World War II. There was no revolutionary ideas in them, but they were well-written and structured. I'm uncertain how popular they were, but suspect that they were mostly purchased by experienced players who wanted more than WRG could provide. Bruce Ree Taylor came out with a World War II version of his Challenger rules called Firefly. As with Challenger, these were very complex, but among those who liked complexity, they were very popular. For those players experienced with Challenger, they were easy to get into, but for other players, less friendly. As with most of the game systems developed by Bruce, when he passed away, they tended to fade away as well. Without Bruce driving the development of new content, the combination of complexity and lack of supporting content or material resulted in their eventual demise. The only short-term exception was possibly Challenger. Crossfire Rules and Organisation for Company-Level World War II Gaming uses combat mechanics that simulate the interplay of fire and movement combined with com command system that represents unit flexibility. Emphasis is on the infantry combat. Crossfire is an innovative set of rules very unlike most other systems out there. Turns, having the initiative, is the term in Crossfire which loosely m matches the concept of a turn in most games, are not sequential as in Step 1 movement, Step 2 artillery fire, Step 3 melee, etc. And distances and moves are not measured. This different approach makes for a breathlessly exciting game system or a breathlessly exciting game system where critical situations are developed realistically and resolved quickly. The mechanics also make for amazing quick armies. Scenarios that have previously taken more than a day to complete or finish within a few hours. Once you try the game, you won't want to go back to others, believe me. Quite frankly, these rules aren't very new, coming out in 1996, and to this day they have a very loyal gathering or very loyal group of gamers that still rave about them, so there must be something extremely good about them. I find them reasonable, even though I'm not that much of an in I don't have that much interest in squad scale micro armor rules, but uh, these are definitely the first of the group that I've currently covered that I would recommend people to consider. The one interesting thing about Crossfire is Crossfire does focus primarily on infantry actions at the company level with squads as the smallest element. Some people play with house rules which add more detail to the armour rules, but the existing rules work fine as Crossfire is, prim is primarily an infantry-oriented rule set. These are possibly the first set of rules which are still popular and being played on a regular basis today that I can talk about of the list that we've so, car so far discussed. There was a distinct evolutionary process occurring in the UK, with WRG players moving to Challenger. While Challenger proved popular, the last version was less than popular, and Ian Clark and Mike Jones decided to develop their own set of rules, which, according to the designer, were designed to overcome issues with Challenger. The result was a free set of rules becoming available in 1997 called Battle Group. The, first, the final version of WRG rules were also perceived as being problematic, and many remaining players of these rules gravitated to Battle Group. Battle Group, or these rules, Battle Group, have been surprisingly popular and still played at clubs and competitions today, or at least they were four or five years ago, last time I saw. They are very detailed and complex, but a lot of effort seems to have been made to make them as playable as possible, allowing for experienced players to complete a game in a reasonable time frame. Focusing on modern conflicts, the sequence of play is very intricate. I suspect these are not suitable for inexperienced players. There is nothing revolutionary in the game system, just a more polished slant of the standard mechanics most players were familiar with. There is a World War II version which can be downloaded from the BGMRIO group site as well. If you're new to the hobby, then this could be an option if you don't want to spend money on rules, but it is a rather complex and detailed set of rules. 
Main Panzer is a very interesting set of rules from the US, which uses a rather advanced sequence of play. Each player activates a platoon and executes its actions, followed by the opposing player doing the same until all platoons have been activated. The non-phasing player can conduct opportunity fire, so both players are constantly involved as the game progresses. The fire combat system is nice and simple, with a die roll to determine if a hit is achieved and another die roll to determine the effect of the hit. This is a very standard fire combat system, so it represents minimal innovation. However, there is a focus on simplification which could assist, or which does assist in playability. After looking at Firefly and Battle Group, this is a real stab at the playability issue and seems to achieve this particular objective. While my investigations are minimal, I really like many aspects of these rules. The only downside is, while six minutes a game turn is reasonable and represents the state of the art at this point in time at this scale, it does not lend itself to a highly fluid and mobile game. Flames of War and Blitzkrieg Commander provide a much more fluid game, but with much less advanced sequence of play. Schwer Company, designed by Troy Ritter, is another attempt at creating a more playable set of rules at this scale. I must admit not being aware of these rules until many years after they were first published. They seem to have a loyal, if small, following. They use a rather aesthetically pleasing quick reference card system, but with the classic issue that players need to keep their element types down. With, while the scale would imply a game of battalion size as possible, the recommendations is each side should consist of a company or 20 elements. Never, have playing these, never having played these rules, this makes me think there must be a reasonable effort in playing a game, as this would represent a very small game using most other rules. The sequence of play attempts to simulate simultaneous movement by flipping activities between the two players during the impulse phase. However, unlike other sequences of play which use this type of system, each player has a limited but variable choice of what he can do in each subphase. It's not a bad system, and I can see some benefits in it, but this could be why the element total needs to be kept low. The rest of the sequence of play is typical. One area which does represent a major step forward is the ability of elements to fire twice in lieu of, com- in lieu of movement. The game system can also also uses action points which need to be expended in order to conduct an action in the impulse phase. This is not a unique system but is a good way of reflecting troop type quality and experience. As Flames of War came out in 2002, I suspect they took all the limelight and these rules were never as popular as they could have possibly been. Flames of War by Phil Yates represents the most significant revolution in the development of squad-level micro-armour rules since Angriff. While primarily designed for 15mm scale figures, I still class it as micro-armour set of rules. In terms of mechanics, there was nothing revolutionary. Instead, it was the package as a whole which was revolutionary. Flames of War was purely focused on playability rather than attempting to duplicate history. This represents a 180-degree flip on the standard trend of greater complexity and detail and proved to be a resounding success. Apart from its ease of play, it was supported by a large body of material. This includes scenarios, army lists and detailed point systems. This allowed for highly competitive play, another secret to its success. Love them or hate them, Flames of War represents a gaming singularity which has had a significant effect on the hobby. While their popular popularity has waned, they brought in a lot of new players into the hobby and should be commended for that. They also made 15 mil mil figures much more popular, with a host of other 15 mil rules coming out after these were first published. Battlefront World War II is an attempt to increase playability by the use of cards, and I must admit they did a good job. Each player has a card for each element type, which provides everything required to use that element type. While not a game mechanic feature, this is a feature which does enhance play. The issue with this system is if there are too many different element types, the player is overwhelmed with cards and the benefits quickly become become negative. The sequence of play is a basic I-go, you-go system with fire, move, fire and close combat. The fire combat system uses a differential system and many other basic mechanics are standard and familiar. The major focus is on simplicity, which like Flames of War was almost certainly a reaction to the incredible complexity of rules designed prior to this. These rules have a lot of gloss and are very nice, and I must admit I rarely ever see them um, but I must admit I rarely ever see them being used. I suspect when they came out in two thousand two, Flames of War, and to a lesser extent Warhammer World War II were getting all the attention. 
Blitz 3 Commander, based on GW Warmaster by Rick Priestley, has achieved a certain level of success. The quality of the rules are high, and this would appeal to the experienced gamer, who are not that obsessed with minor technical details. The game system, while more complex than Flames of War, is far more playable than Battle Group, Fire, Fireflyer and Challenger. These rules may have been the first of a new trend, going back to a more playable game system while still retaining reasonable accuracy and historical um, viability. In 2009, when the second edition was published, each element represented a squad by default. But in 2010, when the third edition was published, each element now represented a pl- platoon by default. In both versions, you can play the game using either scale, but the element scale focus had really changed by the second edition. The standard GHQ squad level rules is called Micro Squad the Game World War II, which GHQ now provide at no cost. These are very professional produced, professionally produced and with good supporting documentation. The game system is detailed but playable. This represents another attempt by the 6mm community to come out with a set of rules to mimic the popularity of Flames of War. The supporting army lists available for free are very good and make these rules really attractive and I use those army lists as reference material for even other rules. While currently not that popular with the game turn having an unusual scale for contemporary rules, nonetheless it is a good set of rules. I suspect the market is saturated and new rules in this area have a hard time getting traction. The simple end is dominated by Flames of War while the complex end is probably dominated by Battle Group. The, there are other rules not covered here which directly compete with this set. Crossfire from memory. Crossfire from memory. Unless a new set of rules offers something really new and innovative, it will generally not be adopted by the figure gaming community, and that appears to be the problem with these rules. Nonetheless, if you want to get into the hobby and you want to get a set of rules that are professional and you don't want to spend any money, these are a good option. Seven Days to the River Rhine look like very interesting rules. Using command tokens to regulate movement and combat, the rules are reasonably simple, with the rules books being about 44 pages in length. It's designed for 15 mil figures on a 4 by 6 foot playing area with a reasonable low, reasonably low number of elements, which gives you a reasonably quick game. The scales I've listed are all estimates, as the game is supposed to not have fixed scales, with weapons having almost no range limitation. Infantry are limited to 12 inches, but other weapons can fire across the playing area, only limited by line of sight. The key to the game is how you expend command tokens, which allows an element to move or shoot. Some reviews claim the rules are contradictory, but I've not heard the rules are difficult to learn, so I'm not quite sure what that particular complaint means. Each player commands a company, so it almost fits into the skirmish scale zone. Panzer Truppe is a simple set of rules, with the rules consisting of about 25 pages of actual rules. It uses a mixed I go, you go sequence of play, with the axis moving, followed by the allies firing, and then the axis firing. This sequence is then repeated in reverse, ending the game turn. The fire combat uses a hit system, followed by a damage system. It takes into account side and rear armour. The game turn scale is not specified, but as a Panzer 4 can cover 200 metres in a game turn, it's probably from 1 minute to 5 minutes per game turn. This puts these rules close to a skirmish scale set of rules, which means you do not need many figures for a game. A reasonable amount of supporting material is in the rules, but players will need to carefully consider the type of scenarios they wish to play. O Group is a set of rules which has many of the fans of the two Fat Lardy series of rules salivating and really looking forward to. The initial comments I've received in the videos um, is extremely positive and available on YouTube if you want to look at it. This has made also the rules much easier to learn, which seems reasonably simple regardless of whether or not you'd want to watch it on a video or not. Players of Chain of Command would be familiar with some of the game systems. If you're new to gaming and are interested in this scale, I probably would recommend these rules among all others, as they seem to be the most contemporary, very, very nice, lots of bling, and very complete. O Group is a set of World War II battalion level rules designed for a player to command, obviously, a battalion sized force plus support or a multiplayer game where each player can command a battalion as part of a larger battle group. The rules introduce some exciting command mechanisms that encourage the players to think about the allocation of reserves as well as commanding their forces in action. The rules include army lists covering the US, UK, Germany and Soviet Union for the latter war period, but the rules can be used with a historical unit structure to give the game a little bit more historical credibility if you so desire. 
while certainly not covered, covering all the rules which have been published in the last 50 years, the rules covered here provide us with a good cross-section and allows us to determine what game design trends were at work. While a host of minor and detailed rules were introduced over this period, my focus is on underlying game systems and packaging. The main development was in sequence of play, a fire combat system, complete complexity and completeness. The sequence of play generally fell into one of two types, sequential movement in both combat and movement, or alternatively, a simultaneous fire in one phase and sequential fire in the other. There were a lot of minor structural differences, such as separate close combat phases, artillery phases, aircraft phases, and alternate fire and move to reflect HHW, overwatch, and normal direct fire, but these are not really structural differences. Either system could be complex or simple, and there were advantages and disadvantages for both. Once the move from simultaneous, simultaneous sequence of play to sequential sequence of play occurred, only minor details differed after this. Most of the fire combat rules covered used a simple process of determining if a hit was achieved, which can involve observation and the effect of a hit. The real major change was the introduction of a save die roll. In the older rules, the fire threw a dice to hit and then spun a dice to penetrate. With a save throw concept, the defender now spins the save throw. A simple idea, but it was very effective on many levels. Flames of War used this system, however I am certain it was borrowed from other unrelated sets of fantasy rules. The early rules were reasonably playable, but still focused on technical detail and accuracy. Because the detail was kept to a manageable level, the result was a reasonably playable set of rules, such as the early WRG rules. This moved quickly to rules which were so complex they lacked playability. Flames of War changed the focus to pure playability, and this won the day. Most rules which have been published in the last, let's say, five years have focused on simplicity and quick play. At this scale, the focus needs to be playable playability, something most rules designers understand but find difficult to implement. The other critical factor or change was completeness. Creating the rules is only a small part of providing a complete product or solution. A host of supporting material needs to be created to allow a player to quickly assemble an army and play a game. The early WRG rules achieved this because of the work done by Bruce Reed Taylor and Ian Shaw in creating army lists, equipment lists and scenarios. Today the IO group site provides players with an extensive up-to-date army list for WRG rules, which also supports Battle Group for that matter. This could be the reason why Battle Group and Flames of War still run conventions today, supporting material. On a smaller scale, R. Zimmerman and D. Myers did the same with Ungriff. Another interesting development, or I may say alternative trend, was the way games were set up. Early rules seemed to focus on historical battles. These were very simple, but they were often not very accurate and there was minimal focus on point system and competition play. Many rules recommended large playing areas for best play. I'm uncertain how often this actually occurred due to the logistics of creating a large playing area. Arranging a big group game took a lot of effort, time and space, which limited the utility of the rules if there was a main focus. After the historical trend, the hobby moved to a point system to facilitate competition and play balance. WRG seemed to be the main proponent of this trend, possibly because of their experiences with ancient rules and competitions. As a result, a lot of detailed point-based scenario books were published in the UK, and this trend continued up to Battle Group, and even Flames of War rules used it. These changes were all trends, and either system can be viable, historical or points. However, in all these systems, a major problem occurred. When players wanted a game, they all wanted to attack with their prized armour. The result was many games becoming meeting engagement. At best, the scenario may provide one player with a slightly more forces or variable reinforcements. This resulted in many games having minimal movement. Often I used to see games being played in competitions, and after three hours when I returned, nothing seemed to have changed. Flames of War, being very much a beer and pretzel set of rules, overcome this slightly by allowing for very rapid and volatile play, and this provide, proved reasonably and also providing reasonable scenarios, which was highly successful. The keys seemed to be scenarios, either historical or universal, with one side attacking with, you know, 150 to 200% superiority against the other. If both players want to attack, then reinforcements would arrive at the halfway point to allow the battle to swing the other way. However, at this scale, this suggestion or this idea is difficult to implement. Flames of War, in particular, was a set of rules designed to work with reasonably universal scenarios, and this had an important 
game design trend which contributed to its success. That is, the scenarios gave you a lot of activity on the playing area and generally could be completed within a reasonable period of time and there was generally a winner and a loser. Scenarios are a surprisingly important gap for many rules, as even poor rules will work, will work well if the scenarios are constructed well. This is, was especially the case with early WRG rules, which did not work when both sides were evenly matched. I found constructing reasonable scenarios allow, allowed these rules to work surprisingly well, even the original 1970s version. In conclusion, the main points which result in a rules or set of rules becoming popular can be summed up with these five points. Playability, ease of learning, three to six hour game duration, supporting army lists and equipment lists and scenarios. While not essential, a point system drives many of these success criteria, so is a special success criteria of itself. Other less critical but still important factors is the structure and professionalism of the rules print or PDF file as well as their usability and utility. And so we come to an end of my episode 2 of my video on micro armor game system design which in this case provides an overview of squad section scale figure gaming rules for World War 2 and Cold War periods. Alle guten Dingen, kommen zu einem Ende.